911, what is your emergency? Um, we need someone here at the Columbia Daily Tribune. What's going on? I'm, I'm not sure. I was just told to call 911. There's somebody hurt outside. Is there anybody who can tell me what's going on there? Uh, here. We're at the main building of the Tribune. And what's going on? In the parking lot, the sports editor, Kent, laying on the ground. He was convicted primarily on the word of Charles Erickson, a man who claimed to be Ryan's accomplice, although he seemed to know very little about the crime when police interviewed him. Hey there, my name is Sylvie, and in this one, I'm taking you all the way to Columbia, Missouri, to tell you the story of a young man named Ryan Ferguson. See, Ryan was only 17 years old when this story began. A crime took place somewhere in Colombia, and the police couldn't really solve it, so it went unsolved for about two years. Until someone had a dream that Ryan and one of his friends committed this crime together. And somehow this was enough for both of them to end up on trial. But in the trial, the only evidence presented against them was this dream and the testimony of a single witness who is What's the word I'm looking for? Disgusting. And I'm sure as you guessed it, this ends with a lot of taxpayer money going into someone's pocket. So if you're ready, I say buckle up and let's go. At two o'clock in the morning on November 1st, 2001, 48-year-old Kent Heitholt, sports editor of the Columbia Daily Tribune, signed off his computer and left the newspaper offices. Less than 15 minutes later, two newspaper custodians saw two white men standing next to Heitholt's car in the Tribune parking lot. Editor Kent, laying on the ground, pool of blood, looks like he's been shot or something. Okay, he's on the parking lot behind the Tribune on the KFC side? Yes, yes. Who did you see in the area? I saw two guys in the area. Were they white or black? White. I'd say 1920. What were they wearing? I, I don't know. This gal, she saw them. She walked out to okay. smoke a cigarette, saw them duck down behind the car. Okay. I looked out and saw them, and I said, what's going on? I knew it was Kent's car, and I said, Kent? And they didn't look up. Nobody did anything. Somebody's been hurt, man. Okay, so you saw them duck down behind his car? Yes. Okay, and then where did they go after that? I don't know, up, up towards the new building, uh, towards 4th Street, I guess it's 4th. Hyde Holt was next to his car with severe head wounds and he had been strangled to death. Hyde Holt's watch and keys were missing, but his wallet was still inside the car. Police questioned both custodians. One of them said that he saw one of the men in the parking lot enough to provide a sketch artist with information to create a composite sketch. But the other custodian, Jerry Trump, said he did not see either man. Police began their investigation, but they weren't really going anywhere with it. So the case went cold really fast. And it stayed cold for about two years. That is when a 17-year-old boy named Charles Erickson had a dream that him and his friend, Ryan Ferguson, committed this crime. See, what happened was, on the night of the murder, Charles Erickson and Ryan Ferguson, two high school boys, were out drinking. And as teenage boys often do, Charles Erickson got fucked up. So he couldn't remember half the night. He didn't remember how he got home or what they really did while they were out. According to Ryan Ferguson, yes, Charles Erickson got trashed and then Ryan drove him home and then Ryan went home and the night was over. But Charles Erickson started reading newspaper articles about Hyde Holt's murder. And the more he read, the more he convinced himself that him and Ryan must have committed this crime together. So eventually he told a friend and the friend went to the police. And that is how it happened that on March 10th, 2004, police went and picked up Erickson. And after a very brief interrogation, he confessed to the crime. And of course, he implicated his friend, Ryan Ferguson, as well. Ryan was picked up the same day and he denied any involvement. But of course, they didn't believe him. So they were both charged with first degree murder and robbery. Erickson pleaded guilty to both and got 25 years in prison. Ryan, on the other hand, went to trial. So the trial started in the fall of 2005. 
there was no physical evidence that tied either of the boys to this crime. And of course, the only thing the prosecution could rely on was Erickson's dream and a new star witness. See, if you recall, at the beginning I told you that two custodians were questioned by the police, but only one of them was able to give a description of only one man they saw in the parking lot. The other custodian, Jerry Trump, said he did not see either men well enough to give a description. But see, somehow, miraculously, in the trial, Mr. Jerry Trump, custodian of the year, was able to identify both boys. How could that be, you might ask? Yes, he was gross. I told you, he was a convicted sex offender, a pedophile, <laughs> to be precise. See, Trump told his story on the stand, which according to him, started with him being, yes, disgusting, and so he went to prison for it. Then he got out of prison, but he couldn't contain his disgusting urges, so he went back to prison. It was during his second visit that he received newspaper clippings from his wife, newspaper clippings of Heidholt's murder, and there were photos of both boys being arrested. And that is when Mr. Trump, custodian of the year, was all of a sudden able to remember that those were the boys he saw at the crime scene. So the prosecution created a theory, which was basically that the boys got drunk and then they left the bar with the intent to rob somebody. And that's how they came across Heidholt and they robbed him and strangled him to death. The only part of that story that doesn't really add up is that Heidholt's wallet was in the car. So, why did they rob him if they didn't take that? But apparently this was enough for the jury to convict Ryan. So in December of 2005, he was convicted of second degree murder and robbery, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Of course, while in prison, Ryan never stopped fighting to prove his innocence. And in 2009, his wishes were granted. When somebody, who you already may know from a different case got involved. So in a nutshell, if you don't know her, her name is Kathleen Zellner. She is actually known for helping wrongfully incarcerated people get out of prison and get their convictions overturned. You may have seen her in the docuseries Making a Murderer because she is the new attorney of Stephen Avery. But more good things were to come in 2009. Because Charles Erickson at some point reached out to Ryan Ferguson's lawyers to let them know that he had changed his mind about what happened that night, that he no longer believed that Ryan was involved in the murder. He believed that he committed it alone. And then a few months later, he changed his mind again. But that time around, he said, nah, I got nothing to do with this either. So a petition was filed. But then in 2011, a new petition was filed because by that point, even touchy-feely custodian Jerry Trump changed his mind. He said he didn't actually receive any newspaper clippings about the murder from his wife while he was, you know, sitting down a little bit, thinking about his actions. As a matter of fact, he said the newspaper clippings came from the prosecution. So the prosecution showed him photos of the boys and asked him, are you sure you didn't see them? And in hopes of leniency in his own case, he took the stand and perjured himself. But in 2013, they were able to file yet another petition on behalf of Ryan, because by that point, his attorneys realized that the prosecution not only knew that Jerry Trump's wife didn't send him any newspaper clippings, but they knew it straight from the horse's mouth because they interviewed her and she told them that she never sent any newspaper clippings to her creepy ass husband in prison. So knowing this, the prosecution went to Jerry Trump and they told him to lie about it. And in a hearing for this petition, Jerry Trump actually admitted to lying on the stand. When you pointed to Ryan Ferguson in the courtroom and you said, that's the person you saw at the Columbia Tribune parking lot, was that true or false? False. Do you anticipate or want anything for doing this? Yes. 
I'd like to have forgiveness from Ryan and his and his family. And did you make that up, or did someone else make that story up? Someone else did. And who was that? Be Kevin Crane. Crane's the prosecutor from the 2005 trial, but the attorney general's office isn't buying Trump's recantation. How is it that you're able to remember that today and never have been able to remember it up till I had remembered it before. I didn't want to say it because of fear of being in trouble with Mr. Crane. As a result, on November 5th, 2013, the Missouri Court of Appeals reversed Ryan Ferguson's conviction, ruling that the prosecution had failed to disclose evidence that showed that Trump's wife said that she did not mail him newspaper clippings. The court ordered the prosecution to decide within 15 days from that day whether to retry Ryan Ferguson or to appeal the decision granting a new trial. But after seven days, because the prosecution didn't have anything to go on anymore and because they just had their bullshit called, they decided not to pursue the case and Ryan was released. I feel like Jay Leno or something. Yeah, it was a wild day for sure. A lot going on, a lot of emotions. It's been long and uh, I'm glad that the difficult part is over for sure. Really, to get arrested and to get charged for a crime you didn't commit, it's incredibly easy and you can lose your life very fast. But to get out of prison, it takes an army. And, you know, it's just amazing to be here knowing that other people are in my situation, don't have the support and the help that, uh, that I've had. So, you know, this is not an anomaly. I think we need to look at other cases and be aware that this is part of our justice system. And, you know, there are more innocent people in prison. So keep your eyes open and uh, support them as well. Woo boy, this is where this gets good. Because let me tell you, Ryan was not playing. Because in March of 2014, Ryan sued everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody and their loved ones. He sued the city, he sued the county, the circuit court judge that prosecuted him, and a bunch of police officers and several other investigators that were somehow involved in his case.